أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله على خير خلقه أجمعين محمد وعلى آله الطيبين الطاهرين لا سيما بقية الله في الأرضين يا صاحب الزمان أنت المعزى في مثل هذه الليالي ونسأل الله أن يعجل فرجك وبذلك تعجيل فرجنا بأبي أنت وأمي ونفسي يا أبا عبد الله أشهد لقد اقشعرت لدمائكم أظلة العرش مع أظلة الخلائق وبكتكم السماء والأرض بسكان الجنان والبر والبحر صلى الله عليك عدد ما في علم الله لبيك داعي الله لبيك إن كان لم يجبك بدني عند استغاثتك ولساني عند استنصارك فقد أجابك قلبي وسمعي وبصري سبحان, رب سبحان ربنا إن كان وعد ربنا لمفعولا ولا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله العلي العظيم إنا لله وإنا إليه راجعون وسيعلم الذين ظلموا آل محمد أي منقلب ينقلبون والآقبة للمتقين قال الله عز وجل في كتابه الكريم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم وأمر أهلك بالصلاة واصطبر عليها لا نسألك رزقا نحن نرزقك والعاقبة للتقوى آمنا بالله صدق الله العلي العظيم السلام عليكم ورحمة الله تعالى وبركاته فاستا نفوموس Thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for the opportunity to go online for the majalis for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loved Abu Abdullah al-Hussein so much. He loves him so much that the Holy Prophet says Hussein um minni wa anam min Hussein ahabba Allahu man ahabba Husseina. So us, by us showing our love to Abu Abdullah al Hussein, we also gain the love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Also, condolences to the Imam of our time, Imam al-Mahdi al-Qa'im al-Muhammad Abdullah ta'ala farja, and to our esteemed scholars, our maraja', and to the Ummah at large for this great calamity. Raziyatan ma'adhamaha such a great calamity and according to Yara Ashura a calamity like no other in Islam <laughs> um, something that I, just before continuing with my lecture that I would like to share please don't make noise please I'm singing but you can't sing when I'm talking no cool one thing that I'd like to mention, which is quite disappointing, and maybe I'm also an agent adding to the disappointment, is that us as followers of Ahlul Bayt, 
our relationship with the whole Quran is quite um you know uh, the other night I remember before we start the lecture as I normally do playing the recitation of the Quran it's not about numbers of course but several people left I'm like but it's the majlis of Imam al-Hussein alayhi salam the night before Abu Abdullah al-Hussein in his camp they were reciting Quran I, Akila Akila no no please In this camp, they were reciting the Holy Quran when the head was severed and was carried on a spear and was carried on a spear. It was reciting Quran several places. One of my teachers, Sheikh Talib al Khaqani, wrote a very interesting book. He didn't want to share it with me yet, but he wrote a book about the verses that the head of Imam al Hussein was reciting in different stations when it was stopped. First, when it was taken to Kufa. I'm speaking, please. Mm. First when it was taken to Kufa, then when it was taken to, to on the way to Cham, then in Cham, several places where they stopped with the head. There are verses that it was uh, reciting and those verses are recorded in the Hadith. So he wrote a book about mm. that. So it is very disappointing, I have to say, for to find some followers of Ahlul Bayt whenever you play the Quran or whenever you have programs, there's no recitation of Quran. We're trying to change that culture, We're trying to build a relationship between us and the Holy Quran. Ah. Just a hadith, just a hadith, just a hadith to encourage that. Just in, a hadith to encourage that is if um, there's a hadith, one to step, but today. Hadith to encourage that is it is said that whatever verse or whatever you recite from the Holy Quran will um, in the grave be a, 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 a very close friend, just like the prayer in the in last night lectures, last night's lecture I mentioned. Just like the prayer, the verses that you recite in the Holy Quran, it will be like a shield, it will be like a friend in the grave that will protect you and guard you and uh, defend you against all the torments in the grave. So maybe you may commit uh, some sins that, will, that you'll see the reality of, because in Barzakh it's the reality of our sins that we see, it's not the punishment. So you'll see the reality of those sins. But as the Quran says, defend yourself or push by that which is good. Uh, in Al-Hasanat, you've hidden the sayyat, indeed good deeds, push away the bad deeds. So the little bad deeds, by performing your salah, by reciting the Quran, the Arah of Asura, and all these things, they create a barrier, they create uh, a defense for you in the grave um, that will keep you against those comments, the reality of your sins. So this is where you see how your small good deeds are and um, in al hasana bi ashara, that the good deed is by is tenfold, and the bad deed is only one time. So your one verse that you recite in the Holy Quran is worse than is heavier and weightier and better than so several sins that you may have committed. Just needed to emphasize this so that we create a relationship with ourselves. If you can't recite the Quran, listen to the Quran daily weekly, but try to always be um, Ya Allah, uh, technology failing us again. أفلح من صلى على محمد وعلى محمد الله All right. Uh, excuse me. I don't know. It's the network again. At least today, we managed to get in. <clears throat> so the little things that we do, just the quick up, the little things that we do, they are our defense in the grave. For we see the reality of our actions. Uh, 
Oof. Technology. Yeah. Tonight's uh, discussion is family and salah. Her praying in with the family. The verse that you started with, Surah Paha. I'm quoting so many verses of from Surah Paha. Surah Paha, chapter number twenty, verse hundred and thirty-two. Wa mur ahla kabis salati. Akila. Allo ala Muhammad ala Muhammad. In the if you sit here, don't. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad. Surah Taha. Wa mur ahla kabis salat. Wa sabr alaiha. لا نسألك رزقا نحن نرزق والعاقبة للتقوى. And enjoin or command your family to pray and be patient with it. لا نسألك رزقا. We do not ask you for any sustenance. نحن نرزق. We sustain you. والعاقبة للتقوى. So, adjusting to the pandemic that we are currently in, uh, many people were forced. Many people were forced to now start praying at home because mosques are closed and prayers have to be have to perform your prayers. But now you can't perform them in the mosque. Uh, it was a big issue last year on Eid. It was a very big issue last year on Eid that uh, people couldn't have Eid car. They go and pray in the park. We couldn't pray in. Uh, Union building, where we usually pray our Salat al nothing could happen. So now what has to happen now? People have to pray either in their families or with friends or whatnot. It was a big issue. Now the problem is we are used to going to the place and performing Salat al and the Imam does the Salah, recites for us and everything. Now we have to learn how to perform Salat al It was a very difficult uh, situation last year. But Alhamdulillah, uh, we thank Allah for knowledge and guidance from our scholars. But now adjusting towards the pandemic and now having these prayers at home and perhaps even going forward for um, some of us who the mosque is far or some of us who are... Own, there is no mosque in your locality or there is no Salat al or everything, even beyond the pandemic or even before the pandemic. Uh, done. Even before the pandemic, people could, some people could not go and perform their Salah in a mosque or in congregation. So now it's different. Alhamdulillah, we can. Uh, after, inshallah, we will be able to, and then as long as they still take us from level three, four, five, back to three, back to four, back to five, closing, opening, and whatnot, the habit or the um, culture, let's call it a culture, the tradition of praying in congregation at home has to be inculcated. But now, which methodology do we follow when instilling this new teaching? The children were never used to praying in jama'at at home. Uh, so now they have to. How do you do this? Do we follow the classic, classic common teaching of beat them when they don't pray? Like this one, making noise. Just don't make noise. Beat them when they don't pray. Oh, um, so that is the classical one that we know that oh, when a child is seven years old, you must beat them if they don't want to pray. Do we follow that method or do we follow? Um, uh, I remember one brother says he was impressed with it. I wasn't really, I was a bit uncomfortable with it. Do we leave them and let them do and let them find their own way? Uh, in several families that I've visited in Iraq, that's how it is. The father will wake up do his fajr and get on with his day. Whether the boys or the girls do it, he says, no, they're Muslim. They know the, they know the responsibilities. They go to the mosque, they go to these places, should be doing it on their own. Do we follow that method or do we take a middle path? 
Now, the verse that we started with of the Holy Quran gives us the Quranic directive of how to do this. It gives us the middle path. So it tells us to it tells us to command our families to perform salah. Command them, tell your kids no, it's time for prayer. Uh, come, let's pray, or this or that. Either way, whether you pray in Jamaat, individual or whatnot. But the second part gives us a sort of uh, gives us a, a boundary on how to go about it. Was tabir alayha. Istabar is from sabr. So whenever you enjoin them, whenever you enjoin them, whenever you enjoin them to pray, be patient with it. Don't enforce it. Don't coerce them. Don't make it uncomfortable for them. Don't make it unbearable. Whenever they think about prayer, they think about ish, this chore, ish, this burden, ish, this. That is the thing. Unfortunately, that's that's how uh, in many masajid and many um, sp- uh, speeches, that is how salah is taught to us. That is how salah is um, taught and instilled upon people. Instead, the Quran says, Was tabir alayha. Yes, you have ordered them to pray. Don't be forceful with it. Be kind with it. Mm -hmm. Refrain from scolding them if they don't. Because, look, okay, fine, there's a punishment or whatnot, or maybe a a, a, a loss of tawfiq and whatnot. But if you scold them, this this is the thing, especially when it comes to religious matters. I'm not talking about other matters, if they break a plate, if they break a cup, So the thing is, I don't care about, I'm not talking about taking plates, taking cups, you know, uh, putting too much salt in the food and whatnot. That's something else. But when it comes to religious matters, what is important is for us to consider that these people, you are, create, you are basically creating a foundation for this person's relationship with God Almighty. You are creating a relationship for them with God Almighty now. If you make that relationship about force and make that, and make that relationship about uh, power and scolding and fighting and whatnot, it's going to ruin the relationship for them. They're not going to enjoy it anymore. So rather, as we see, um, many, teacher, many teachers will tell you that, no, reward them. Reward them for, for when they pray. Give them sweets. Oh, mashallah, you have prayed today. Okay, here's a sweet. Here's five ranyan, 20 ranyan, 10 ranyan, something. Narrate stories to them. Narrate stories to them about the virtue of prayer. Narrate stories to them about the virtue of prayer, telling them, no, prayer will grant you this. Prayer will... Uh, pro- uh, all these things, so that they fall in love with the prayer. One of our sheikh, uh, one of our shuyukh from Cape Town, sheikh, um, Shafiq, gives a very interesting definition to taqwa. He says that taqwa, we shouldn't only take it as fearing, number one, and we shouldn't also, maybe maybe that's the first level. We should also not take it only, uh, only as uh, fulfilling our responsibilities or our duties towards Allah. But we should take it as loving Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because as we normally hear, as we normally say, when you love somebody, you want to be the way they want you to be. Allahumma ja'alni kama tuhib, wa la taj'alni, Allahumma anta kama uhib. Taj'alni kama tuhib, sorry. As Amir Mu'mineen said, Oh Allah, you are as I love. So make me as you love. So even with this salah, the meeting will end in 10 minutes. 
even with this salah, now I have to run through my points. Even with this salah, we have to teach it to our children in such a way that they love it. They enjoy doing it. It's not a burden upon them. It doesn't bore them. It doesn't, uh, they'd rather stop their soccer game or whatever to pray. Instead of feeling like, ah, no, I, you know, I, 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 even as uh, parents, we should also make it that Salah should not be about you. Salah should not be about you saying that, yeah, when I'm not here, you don't pray. No, don't make it like that. That's a bad route to go. That's a bad route to take because once you go that route, it's going to be instilled in the child. Okay, that guy's not here and he's not here, here to force me. So I'm going to play my PlayStation. I'll play late. I'll play later mm -hmm. until midnight strikes. Then even or even Fajr strike and you hadn't, hasn't done Maghrib, hasn't done Aisha. Now Fajr is here. He's too tired to perform Fajr. He's here five minutes before Fajr. Mm -hmm. You see, don't, don't, we should avoid making it like that. A beautiful advice that I, I saw and sent and forwarded to several people a few days ago by um, the very famous and, no, and notable speaker, um, Haj Hassanin Rajab Ali. He says that Teach your, teach your children that prayer is gratitude. Teach your, teach your children that prayer is thanking God rather than just obeying him, thanking him. Oh, no, alhamdulillah, you went to school today. Some kids are deprived of that. Thank God. You have a meal now. Thank God. Um, you are healthy. Thank God. You have both parents. Or oh, you have a parent. Thank God. All these things. Teach them that it is thanking God. And in that way, it will change. It will change the narrative that they have about prayers. It will change the narrative that they have about prayers. Prayers for them will then be enjoyable. Prayers for them will then be like, oh, you know what? I need to do this. Not because I'm forced, but because I, I really like doing it. And the effect thereof is good. And the, what I feel from it is good. Fall in love with their prayers. Change the narrative. Don't make it a thing of force. Don't make it a thing of... Uh, don't make it a thing of um, coercion, force, fighting, arguing every day about it. Rather make it a thing of love. Uh, because the normal way that prayers are taught to people it, it kills the value thereof. Yes, some may stick to it and whatnot, but it becomes a chore. We don't want prayers to be a chore. We want them to be a lifestyle. We want them to be something that we enjoy doing. Something that, uh, as I mentioned in last night's lecture, that when you get the reward thereof, it even shows in your face that this person enjoys. There are some people who pray, but they don't even have that mood. They don't have that, like, inshallah. Uh, so this is my advice to parents and this is my call to everyone that yes, praying, praying at home is very important. Praying at home is very important if you stay far, far away from the... Look, praying in the mosque is mutahab. Very highly recommended, of course. But sometimes you should pray at home. Yes, pray at home. It's all about romance. I remember when I said this to somebody, they said that, hey, this is romantic Islam is problematic. It's not about being romantic. It's about trying to teach your family the values of Islam and making them enjoy it. Once a week or, or once on a weekend, make sure that, no, you have lunch together and you pray your Zuhur and Asr together. That is a good, that is a good way to then inculcate the habit of having jama'a at home. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to um, make us those good parents, even though they torment us. Make us good parents that um, teach our children proper Islam, that uh, obviously they should learn it from our actions or anything, but for them to learn Islam and love Islam and not just feel like, so that tomorrow when somebody asks them, why are you Muslim, they don't just say, my father is Muslim. Or they don't just say, I grew up in a Muslim family. 
rather they, they should say no it's because i love god or i love islam or i understand islam inshallah ta'ala bye bye <laughs> in today's um majlis today being the sixth night of muharram the sixth night in the arab culture is dedicated to the companions of abu abdullah al hussein i'll try to wrap this us wrap this up in the next four minutes before we cut off or cut us off the companions of abu abdullah al hussein sallallahu alaihi wasallam alay you see that on the night before ashura on the night before ashura he switches off the candles and tells them look you guys these people want me these people want to kill me these people don't have a problem with you all they want is me all they want is my head all they want is my death all they want is to coerce me to do things so guys if look i give you the permission i give you the permission the night i'll switch off the candles go it's the night i'll give it use the night as your shield and go these companions they say lo annani uqta thumma uhra if i was killed and burnt and my ashes be thrown in the sky and this be done to me 70 times ma taraktuka ya hussein i will not leave you ya hussein and then thus abu abdullah al hussein says ma raitu ashabi ashab mithl ashabi i have never seen companions like my companions yes even better than those, those of the prophets because these are a collective that have this attitude they are 72 who have this attitude of not leaving their imam those of the prophet with no this no disrespect of course to the holy prophet but some of them what did they do after the holy prophet died some of them what did, what did they do while the prophet was alive <laughs> sorry what did they do when the prophet was alive so these 72 of abu abdullah al hussein they never left him one special one special companion of the imam sallallahu alaihi wasallam Abis Ashaki Abis Ashaki the one who says Hubbul Hussein a Jannah Abis Ashaki in the battle of Karbala they know who he is but he's so old he's 90 years old you my assistant so what does he do Abis Ashaki removes his shield he removes his shirt he says that yeah okay come come and fight Say, Abit, have you gone crazy? He says, Hubbul Hussein, Ajan. The love of Hussein has made me crazy. The love of Hussein, this is not a craziness of illogical or uh, insanity. No, it's a craziness of commitment that I do not care what happens to me as long as what I do pleases Abu Abdullah Hussein. 90 years old, fighting bravely, fighting f- valiantly. defending the imam of his time bless allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to uh, grant us this loyalty to the imam of our time inshallah bless allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to um make us of those who help the imam of our time when he reappears inshallah bismillah arrahman arrahim salamu ala al husain wa ala ali ibn al husain وعلى اولاد الحسين وعلى اصحاب الحسين ان الله سبحانه وتعالى to have mercy on the deceased and to cure the diseased and to settle the uneased and to send to them the reward of al-fatiha before its salat ala muhammad wa ali muhammad اللهم صل على محمد وعلى ال محمد الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله الرحمن الرحيم مالك يوم الدين اياك اياك نستعين صراط الذين صراط الذين عليهم غير المغضوب عليهم ولا الضالين